So um, now we, we are happy to uh, have uh, Rob from uh, Nginx. He is the VP from uh, Nginx, and he will be talking about uh, how API as a service can improve the customer experience and also how at uh, the security with the internal API cow. So let's try to welcome Rob here. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, let me get him in on the stage first. Uh, hello, Rob. <clears throat> Rick, how are you? Yeah, fine. So um, uh, you can try to share the screen, and then uh, if everyone is if if case is okay, then I will uh I gave the stage to you. Great. Yeah, good, good. So I think the voice is loud in here as well. So um, I will pass the stage to you. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, I'm joining you from lovely California right now, and my goal is to just walk you through for the next 20 minutes or so some of the trends we've seen in our customers around how they're building internal API platforms or what we call API as a service uh, as part of their open banking strategies. And really it's all about improving the customer experience, uh, but also improving a reliable way to do APIs at scale and with security. So to get into this, let me first kind of set a little bit of the uh, backdrop. So why is it that customers even care about uh, API as a service? And as I'm sure everyone tuned in today understands, it, it really has to do with digital transformation. And we see that most companies, um, even in today's unusual times, uh, are finding that they need to offer compelling capabilities online in order to attract and retain customers. Often they don't necessarily have all the components and so they have to work across an entire ecosystem. So in open banking, we're walk, working across a FinTech ecosystem to offer the different kinds of services a, a modern customer would expect from their bank or from a financial institution. The problem is a couple of challenges arrive. There's a lot of complexity getting all of these components networked together and presented to a customer in, as a cohesive service can often be challenging. There's a lot of connectivity challenges, developer challenges, security challenges. And that really leads to the second, which is increased attack surface. There's now a lot more components that make up a modern application or a modern service. And we don't necessarily control all of them. So we have to make sure that we have additional security capabilities to prevent unwanted breaches from those attack surfaces. There's also collaboration challenges, and I don't necessarily mean collaboration tools, I mean between all the different teams that are needed to bring this to life for a customer, your developers that are actually creating APIs, your DevOps teams that are implementing them, your security teams that are securing them, the API management and owners that think about the business logic all of those need to come together and have a way to work across this. Uh, and then finally, as we know well in financial services, uh, time is money. And so we worry a lot about the overall performance. How do I make sure that there's a good end-to-end -end customer experience across this ecosystem of different FinTech applications and services? So we see a lot of these challenges uh, in digital transformation, but if we really kind of step back for a second, we realize that core to all of this and core to open banking in particular are APIs. APIs become the currency and the backbone that drive all of these new revenue and customer opportunities. And we really see that we're, there's an entire new generation of innovation and different business models being built around APIs because of this interest in open banking. So let's, dive into a little bit about APIs in particular. So I'm gonna give you some data to help set the context for what we see. And this comes from some custom surveys that we've done here at um, F5. And what we see is that 80% of organizations are undergoing digital transformation. So that should come as no surprise. There's pretty much all enterprises of all shapes and sizes outside of financial services included that are undergoing digital transformation. That's not the surprise. The bigger stat is the second one you see here. 83% of web traffic is now API traffic. It's just the default way that customers interact with us from their mobile devices, from their websites, from any device. Most of this is now API traffic. Even if they're 
coming at us through a typical website or portal-like experience. So why is this? Why is it that we see APIs as so critical? Well, first of all, APIs are a huge part of revenue growth. Uh, I'm sure many of you, if you're not already uh, immersed in APIs, are exploring it as part of a desire to roll out additional services so that you can capture a greater share of wallet from your customers, offer them a greater breadth of services. We also see that APIs are core to offering a good customer experience. In the digital world, it's quite easy for me to take my business elsewhere or for me to take my attention, which is almost as valuable as my money, and look elsewhere. And so what I want to do is offer a cohesive customer experience where all the wants and needs are served out of my platform or through my business model. And so APIs become critical to offering that kind of experience. Uh, and there's also an element of brand protection. Uh, it may be that uh, a competitor has entered my market and in order for me to keep my incumbent status, I need to be able to react quickly uh, and preserve the brand that I have by offering a competing service. Or it could be vice versa. I'm the startup who's entering the space and I wanna disrupt whoever the incumbent bank is as an example, and I wanna build my brand. Either way, there's often a brand component attached to how well my APIs. And if none of this quite resonates, if more of your APIs are internal and maybe not external in nature, then there is an element of developer productivity. Developers today need to publish their API, they need to define it, document it, and a lot of those components can be very cumbersome, they can take a lot of time, and as a result, we lose the ability to bring a new service to market or to compete effectively in this uh, open banking world. And so a lot rides on our APIs. So let me just take you through two more quick data slides. I promise I won't elaborate too much on these, but I just wanna sort of give you a sense. So we also did a global survey with IDC, if you're familiar with that analyst firm, and we wanted to look at, well, what is the rationale behind all of this? And what you can see is it's pretty widely varied. So looking at the right, what you can, or sorry, the left, what you can see is there's actually, when asked to respond for multiple reasons, a pretty even split across all the reasons why I might actually uh, use API, especially in an open banking. It could be many of the things I've talked about, uh, expanding my ecosystem, uh, expanding my market reach, but a lot of it is about speed of execution and customer satisfaction. So those customer experience elements um, are as prevalent in API adoption as sort of the revenue components. Uh, and so as you can imagine, that creates a whole bunch of priorities. Now, these priorities are at the business or CIO level. And so what we find is that uh, there is a lot of pressure to not only support all of this, uh, but to make it work internally, there's a lot of integration that needs to occur. And there's also a lot of pressure to come up with an easy way to monetize. So it's necessary, but not sufficient to have an API. You also need to secure it, you need to monetize it, and you need to make sure it's always available. So finally, let's just say that's great. We've talked a little bit about digital transformation. We've talked about some of the pressure that puts on APIs in particular, and how that's driving a new set of priorities in a lot of open banking initiatives, but it also drives some API specific challenges. And this will be my last data slide. So what we see is not surprising, like the digital transformation initiative that sort of sits above all of this, when we drill down to API, there's complexity and security challenges as well. In fact, those are listed as number one and number two in the survey we did. But there is a specific set of governance challenges that do come along with APIs. APIs like software uh, get deployed, there's versions, they have to be retired, I have to be able to uh, fork and have different options available, I have to be able to document them. So there's a whole element of API management, not only as a set of tools, but a set of practices that we have to adopt in order to make sure that we're scaling to the millions, if not billions of API calls. In fact, it's not uncommon working with some of the larger uh, financial services in the open banking that companies are seeing 10 to 15 billion API calls a day. 
that's in the 300 to 400 billion a month category. And some of our customers need to do 2 million API calls a second at peak performance in order to properly support customer expectation and across the entire FinTech ecosystem for them in open banking. So we are talking about massive scale and that could be from just a few hundred different APIs that are generating that volume. So governance becomes critical. If I lose an API, I am by definition losing millions of, of potential customer interactions or customer transactions. Okay, so let's transition now. That is a backdrop, the challenges we see, what's driving a lot of the API ecosystem. Let's talk a little bit about this concept of a secure API as a service. And this was really born out of one particular large banking customer that F5 Nginx works with. And in, they were definitely up in the uh, hundreds of billions of API calls per month. And what they found was across this ecosystem, their developers had become too reliant on native cloud services. Now there's nothing wrong with cloud services, but it made it so that as they were expanding globally or as they tried to diversify across multiple clouds, that they their application and their APIs were locked into the services. So they decided to internally deploy their own API infrastructure as a cloud service that could then be scaled across any cloud, across internal applications, across things like Kubernetes and microservices or VMs and bare metal. So they really had to think differently about how do we take API management, decouple it from the underlying platforms we've used in the past and offer it both internally and across our ecosystem as a service. But of course, as in modern day, doing it securely. So let's talk a little bit about it. That's just a high, high level definition. Why is this even coming about? Well, it's really coming about because of a very specific uh, intersection that we're seeing in the market. And it's the intersection between microservices. Um, I assume most of you are familiar with microservices uh, as they generate quite a few API calls themselves. But if you're not, let me just give a super quick in a world where applications are now being broken down into smaller, discrete, reusable components, each one of those components is a microservice. So I can think of uh, my login function, my front end function, maybe if it's, a, if it's an e-commerce application, my loyalty system, um, or different applications within a financial portfolio that make up the banking application, the retail side versus the consumer or the commercial side. All of these could be discrete microservices or maybe even broken down into smaller components. So now I have my application completely decomposed into all these different components. And at the same time, I've also invested in probably an API management strategy to expose external APIs as part of open banking. Well, what we're seeing is there is a clear intersection between these two trends where uh, APIs are growing exponentially. In fact, for every external API that I expose to an endpoint, whether it's a, a, an ecosystem partner or an end consumer, I could have up to 10 internal API calls that are needed among the microservices before I can serve a response back out. And so that's really where there's a lot of pressure for what we call real-time APIs much, much faster. Every single time one of these microservices API calls experiences a performance or security degradation, it has a knock-on effect for the customer. And what we're finding is that in today's environment, if you're not operating at less than 30 milliseconds of latency, then you're not actually meeting customer expectation around that real-time performance. And that's the experience that customers expect. And I can go into a whole 20 minute section on just why it's 30 milliseconds in real time. Uh, if it's of interest, we can, we can follow up, but that's the threshold um, that's part of uh, what defines a modern experience today. And across an API infrastructure, there's a lot of components that go into all of this infrastructure up to your existing CI CD frameworks and your testing. The goal is to get that cloud-like experience for developers, but the speed that's needed for the customer experience. And then what we see on the right is the need to shift a lot of API management to the left. 
well, what do we mean by shifting to the left? I'll show a diagram of this in a second, but basically it means taking a lot of API management and moving it earlier in the software development lifecycle and making it part of the code that a developer can actually access and automate and deploy as part of CI CD. So these are the two backbones to what secure API as a service is. And really, if I were to define it in terms of its three core components that make it different than previous generations of API management, it comes down to these three things. First of all, it's highly automated and CIC integrated. So what I mean here is not the API you're exposing out to the ecosystem or to the customer, but all those internal APIs, the de definition, the publication, the versioning can all be orchestrated via your CI CD. So that just as I deploy the microservice, I can deploy all the API connectivity and security around it. We also see that uh, there's a lot that needs to connect and scale those APIs. Uh, and so you need a different underlying infrastructure, what's referred to as the API gateway or a micro API gateway, because you really need a distributed system to do this. You can't go with uh, the traditional monolithic edge gateway that services all this traffic. You need it all to sit as close to these microservices as possible to kind of get that latency and performance to its best threshold. And then finally, you ultimately need to think about the architecture. You need to decouple how you process API traffic from how you define and publish API traffic. Traditionally, these systems have been tightly coupled but again, that creates uh, performance bottlenecks and security challenges. And so these become the three main building blocks for Secure API as a Service. I have just one last slide left, and then I think we'll have a little bit of time uh, for any Q&A. Uh, but this slide has some complicated builds, so let me take a couple of minutes to go through it, and then hopefully we'll be done. So let me give you an end-to-end -end diagram that really brings home, well, what is a secure API as a service? And, and then ultimately, why is it so important to, to customer service? Well, imagine on the left-hand side, you have your development processes. And on the right-hand side, you have your operations, classic dev and ops. Well, in the middle is a need for self-service. And so what we've seen is that developers have to define their API. You're going to use Swagger as an example to help with that API definition. And then you're gonna onboard that API via a developer portal. And that developer portal is really the self-service capability that's so critical. It's where we'll document the API, understand its SLA, understand its schema, and a lot of the things based on that definition. Well, earlier I mentioned this concept. Uh, oh, and sorry, I should mention that you'll use things like YAML and Git uh, as a source code repository for all that, right? Well, as I mentioned, what you really need to do when you're thinking about secure cloud as a service is begin to shift how you then deploy that to the left. In other words, I'll empower the developers or the left-hand side of this equation to be able to see what this API would look like and how it would perform. And so what you do is you take that API from something like your developer portal and you're gonna put it through a CI CD pipeline. And from there, I'm going to be able to deploy it out to uh, a Kubernetes environment, which is where my microservices may live, or could be a, a VM-based environment. And in the case of F5 Nginx, you're going to use things like Nginx App Protect, which is a, a lightweight uh, web application firewall, and Nginx Controller, which provides uh, the underlying gateway and control plane capabilities, to then see how does this API perform? Am I able to, is it performing as expected? And this is all in the testing phase, so that just as I'm testing the logic of the API, I'm also getting very accurate uh, real world examples of how it's gonna perform and how, where there might be vulnerabilities, how I can catch those vulnerabilities and how I can patch those vulnerabilities. And this is all done in an automated way where we're tearing up and tearing down these environments very, very fast. And what's important is once the developer is happy and signs off, they can then, from that same source code file through the same or a different CI CD pipeline, then deploy it into the production environment. And so, what I'm able to do is not only reduce the latency of how long it takes to get an API published, but I'm also able 
to take advantage of all this modern tooling, take advantage of a microservices architecture and deploy an extremely lightweight and fast API service. Much different than the traditional uh, open banking solutions that maybe came out five, 10 years ago. In this world, we have better collaboration between developers, operations, and security teams where they're collaborating on source code and policy, automating that. Now, to bring it full circle, the benefit of all this is it allows us to give the highest performing and a very secure, reliable API, which in turn drives the customer experience that we are seeing in today's environment. Okay, with that said, I would invite you to certainly join my colleagues uh, in, on some of the other uh, sessions we have across the NGINX F5 uh, family here at this very event. Uh, and as you can see, you're eligible to win a prize. Join any other session besides mine, and you'll be eligible to get a Starbucks e-gift card by visiting our virtual booth. So I know I took up a lot of time, not sure how much we have left. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, we still got uh, got some time. So maybe we have some quick questions. So, um, Bob, you, you you mentioned about the security API, a uh, secure API as a service. So maybe can you describe maybe to uh, what kind of individual or teams that actually may owning that or using that kind of thing well out? Yeah. So there's a couple different roles. Uh, one role I didn't mention, and so I'm glad you brought this up, is the idea of the API product owner or the API manager. They'll own the business logic. Most of what we've seen and what I've shown, though, is really about better collaboration with developer teams and uh, the, develop, the DevOps that then need to operate all the CI CD. So they'll be the ones who own the infrastructure, but they'll do so in collaboration with an API product manager. OK, got that, got that. Another question is uh, maybe a broader question is talking about, so you have uh, uh, very, uh, you have a lot of experience on API. So can you name a few of the common API mistakes that uh, you are seeing or working with different team or your kind, et cetera? Sure. Um, yep, I think the biggest mistake we see is that um, companies are not thinking differently about internal APIs that mm. connect all the microservices to external. And so as a result, they have a lot of performance challenges. The other big thing we see is that they'll try, I'm going to get a little technical for a second, and I apologize, but they'll try to tightly couple things like authenticating IPIs all the way down at the infrastructure level and not thinking about how they want to break up some of these services across this internal cloud. Because what I don't want to do is create any bottleneck where I will in, uh, hurt performance because performance is directly correlated to the customer experience. Okay, so maybe one next time question. So um, I do also have some exper experience with different teams. So they are going to solve some spaghetti problems. They have already uh, messed, up, messed up something, et cetera. So do you have any quick experience or quick tips? How can they maybe leverage your experience to, to, to uh, solve some of the problem? Uh, what is your recommendation to them about uh, some existing maxi integration thing? Yeah. Yeah. So you're thinking, um, you know, you're re referring to like the developers and how they're quickly bringing out a lot of these. And if they make a mistake, how can we help, you know, protect them from yep. those types of mistakes? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So I think the, the most important thing is um, because this can all be automated and it can all be done in a CI CD type framework, uh, it's as easy to roll back to a known good state. Basically, what you're doing is you're treating all the infrastructure itself as code. And so therefore, you can deploy any element of it, which is normally about one time. But what you're talking about is more the reverse. I can undo it and get back to a known good state very easily by just making sure I fork my environment before I make changes and I can always roll back. So once you really think of infrastructure as code and really think of deploying a cloud like that, it offers a, a much more flexibility in recovering from any kind of uh, mistakes. Um, it allows developers to, to kind of run fast and fail fast. Mm, okay, so uh, thanks, thanks for your time. And I, I do also see that some uh, in the chat room people is discussing the 30, 30 minutes second thing and then there is some, some discussion on that one. So you bring a really interesting topic there. So, okay, thanks for your time here. And then yeah. uh, for the for the audience, uh, if you are interested, feel free to visit the uh, Nginx booth and then there's a uh, lot of things you can see. So, okay, thanks, Rob. Yeah. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.